So hello everyone, uh, my name is Jason Cobill. Uh, I work at the University of Ottawa and I'm giving you uh, a talk called the Web Images Masterclass. It's a talk I've given before to refresh Ottawa, but things have changed so much since I gave that talk that uh, I've added a whole bunch of new slides. Um, I'll uh, get us started a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Jason Cobill. By day I'm a mild-mannered uh, mild project manager at the university, but by night I'm an artist and uh, I come uh, from a sort of uh, a long history of working on uh, film projects. I used to do visual effects uh, in Hollywood. I also do a lot of like creative coding, and uh, I, in my spare time I like teaching AI how to paint like Van Gogh. Um, so actually a little bit of a shameless plug, I do workshops about that kind of stuff, so if you're interested in those kind of things, uh, you should look me up afterwards, and, uh, and we'll talk about some of the things that are coming up at Art Engine, which is an organization I work with. Um, so I, uh, I have a sort of vested interest in understanding how images work and uh, how we work with images. So this talk is gonna be going kind of a, it'll be a, an overview of uh, a whole bunch of things. We're gonna go a little bit deep into some of them and hopefully a little deeper than uh, you would go in like a design class, but we're not gonna go like full nerd all the way, so uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna make you look at walls of code. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the history of images on the web. Uh, we sort of take for granted the image tag is a little bit weird. It's a single tag without a closing tag. Uh, why is it that way? Uh, people sort of just made the web as they were going on the fly and way early on, you can actually see all these online still, they're all recorded in uh, some archives someplace. Uh, Mark Anderson, who's kind of a, a, a not a team player in uh, NCSA, decided uh, one day, hey, I've got an idea, I'm gonna put images on the web and I'm gonna call it the image tag. It doesn't have like an SRC URL. Uh, and you proposed an email, and Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, was kind of not really into it. He was like, ah, I've got this other way to do it. Maybe it'll be like an anchor link. And Jay Weber, who was also important, he was uh, thinking, maybe we should like stop and think about how we're gonna do this. And like literally two hours later, there's another email like, hey, I put images on the web by Mark Anderson. <laughs> so he just went ahead and did it, and uh, it kind of stuck. The, nobody bothered to re-change it. That's the very first image on the web. Not very inspiring, but it's kind of cool. It's uh, an old format that we don't really use anymore, but kind of interesting. I'm going to show you what it looks like. It's called an XBM. It was invented by Xerox back when they had like really early operating systems. They, they invented Windows before uh, Microsoft and Apple ripped it off. Uh, the thing about the XBM uh, file is that it's actually a piece of C code that you inject directly into the, uh, into the browser or wherever you're looking at your image. Uh, this is really bad practice, so we don't use this anymore ever. Um, but it's kind of interesting to look at uh, all the bits and bytes that are inside. We actually resurrected this not too long ago, back when cell phones were just starting to have images and graphics on them. We had the WBM, which is the wireless bitmap, which looks a little different, it's just a jumble of numbers, but they really are doing the same thing as that C code. It's just a bunch of like maps of where the bits go. Uh, you can actually still export WBM uh, from Photoshop, uh, but don't use these either. They're not really useful, and they're not compressed. They, uh, they're just one bit per pixel. I, I'm gonna go into a talk about compression, and I know what you're thinking, like, oh no, I have to listen to this guy talk about compression again. Like, why is this always coming up as this thing? Um, but there's a new case for compression. I'm gonna uh, try to sell you on the importance. One of them is that uh, we are seeing this hockey stick dog leg of uh, increase in file size for pages. So uh, the average page that was uh, recorded by archive.org this year uh, was over two megabytes. and. Uh, it sounds like a really heavy package, but most of it's images. It's like 80% images. So uh, if we can crop those images down a little bit, we're gonna save the majority of our space on our sites and things are gonna load faster, they're gonna go quicker. Google uh, prioritizes pages that have a lighter load and that are faster to load. Um, the other thing to know is that uh, on this map, the red bits are where high-speed internet access is available. The green is still dial-up. And Canada's kind of weird because we're all like kind of crushed down near the border, so that covers a lot of people in the urban centers. But on the right-hand side, Canada is like way down 14th for uh, broadband adoption. We, only 40% of people actually have broadband access. Uh, we kind of take for granted, especially working downtown, that everyone's got like super zippy high-speed internet access. But uh, if you're waiting on a modem for an image to load in the background image, uh, you're gonna lose people uh, coming to your website. Uh, the <laughs> picture's even worse. Internationally, uh, in Africa, 0.4% of people have broadband, so if you're working internationally with your websites, having humongous images on your sites is, uh, is gonna be killer. Uh, America's is 20%, uh, Europe is like 30%, amazing, I'm gonna move to Finland right away. Uh, but 
Uh, if you're trying to uh, pitch things to an international audience, you want to keep things as light and nimble as possible. Lastly, second lastly, data plans suck. Uh, people in uh, Canada, notes we're way down on the list, we're near the end, uh, on average only have a two gig data cap. Um, and in other countries, Finland again, uh, they've got like amazing uh, high speed internet access just to your phone. But uh, people uh, here are kind of cognizant about using up all their data plans. You might hear people toward the end of the month say like, oh, I want to check out your site, but I have to wait until the first. Uh, it's also really expensive. Canada, again, showing off how great we are. We uh, have some of the most expensive internet uh, on your phone in the whole world. Uh, there's a really cool site called howmuchitcosts.com. It's kind of fun to plug your URL in, and uh, it'll tell you how much would it cost the average person in Canada to download one page of your site. And in Canada, uh, an average two meg page costs 23 cents. So uh, it's expensive to load your website. So the, uh, the smaller you can make things, the cheaper it'll be. Uh, lastly, the, uh, the Internet of Things is opening up browsers in all kinds of weird places. So your refrigerator or your microwave might have a browser in it. Some of them don't have a lot of RAM, they don't have a lot of bandwidth, so uh, you want to keep things light and nimble if your goal is to do services that will end up on someone's appliances or in their Porsche or on their uh, microwave or TV. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about, uh, first format with compression, and then we're going to go a little bit of a deeper dive into this one because it's kind of easier to understand, is GIF or GIF. Do I have a show of hands for GIF people in the room? There's quite a few GIF people. Oh, there's a lot more than I'm, before. My last talk it was all like GIF people. I couldn't believe it. Uh, oh, I'm getting all kinds of crazy static. Let's see if I can fix that. Yeah, I think it's the GIF guts. I'm going to keep powering on and we'll see what happens. Uh, all right, well, you get static, it's animated. Uh, so uh, the creator of uh, GIF or GIF uh, calls it GIF. Uh, I think he's crazy and uh, we can sell this later. If you guys want to go out to the parking lot, we'll have a fist fight and get it, get it done with. Um, the, the GIF format, this is kind of an X-ray view. It's, uh, it's really good for storing uh, big wide images of color and we hear this all the time. It's good for logos and things, but why is that? Uh, the reason is it uses a technique called run length encoding. Run length encoding is not, uh, not new. In fact, knitters have been using this for like centuries. Uh, the idea is if you wanted to say have a pattern that you were trying to communicate to someone, uh, you would draw it out in a graph and then you would try to say over the phone, say like knit, 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 pearl, 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 pearl. There must be a better way. So what they did was they say you knit twice, you pearl five times, you knit 11 times. What you're doing is just taking wide areas of color and bringing them down into just one a number. So GIF does basically the same thing. It has a, an index of colors at the bottom. So zero is white and one is black, for instance, and they can be in any order. Only 256 colors, you're limited. And then what you say is two of the black ones, or sorry, two of the white ones, five of the black ones, uh, 11 of the, or 13, sorry, of the, uh, the white ones. Um, and that's how GIF works. And GIF was great back in uh, 1983. Uh, when CompuServe invented it. Sorry, I'm getting some weird static. Any way to fix that up? Oh, there we go. G plug. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll try not to move anything. All right. So uh, GIF was really great back in 1983 when CompuServe invented it to send their icons through the phones. Uh, but it's very limited. It's only 256 colors, and uh, moreover, it uh, has a problem uh, with animation. It's super popular for animation, and it kind of made a big comeback. Uh, but what it does is really stores an entire separate image for every frame, which is terrible compression. There's no uh, optimization that runs between the frames. They just, if you've got 99 frames in your image, you've got 99 images in your uh, GIF file. GIF file. Um, Next slide. So a uh, quick uh, pro tip, I've got a little ninja up there for every time I'm going to give you like, a, kind of a hint of something that's uh, maybe a little bit uh, not obvious. Uh, if you use do not dispose as your animation technique, what it does is only saves the bits of the image that changes every frame. So the rest of the image is actually still there, but it's just one big transparent area and it compresses really well. So you can save a lot of space by using do not dispose and you'll go from like an 8 meg GIF file to a 30 kilobyte GIF file. Uh, GIF has a political problem. Uh, 
some old timers will remember back in the early 2000s, uh, CompuServe decided it was the last ditch effort to make money. Hey, everyone is using GIF, you owe us five cents. Uh, and people on the internet were outraged and people like wanted to ban using GIFs. People actually went and protested. These are like super hardcore GIF nerds. Um, but they, uh, they really wanted to uh, abandon GIF and move on to something else. So they invented PNG. There we go. PNG is actually very, very similar to GIF. It's, uh, it's almost an identical ripoff. It has all the same uh, structural components, uh, but there's a few extra cool bells and whistles. One of them is that it can do 24 bits per color instead of just 256 uh, colors. You can go all the way to 16 million. Uh, there's eight bits for red, blue, and green. And it does a really cool transparency thing that GIF doesn't do. You can have faded gradient backgrounds and uh, glows and drop shadows and all kinds of neat things. So in almost every case, uh, PNG is superior to GIF because it gives you more colors and uh, more transparency. And actually the compression has been uh, tweaked a little bit. So instead of just compressing one area of color, you can comp compress patterns of color. So uh, where GIF falls down on like vertical lines and things, PNG can actually store a vertical line with a bunch of different colors and then repeat that a whole bunch of times for free. So it's kind of a neat way to uh, store textures and backgrounds that GIF chokes on. Uh, one problem with uh, PNG is that there's no animation. Uh, there was actually a proposed animation spec for PNG, and there are some weird people who have gone ahead and implemented that. It doesn't really work on any browsers, so don't bother like learning about it. Uh, what the PNG authors decided was that they would rather be really good at single image compression than really bad at animation as well. So they just cut it out from the spec, so it's not, uh, it's not handled. But we've got other ways to do animation, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, PNG files are great. They allow you to store things uh, with a slightly more compressed um, uh, scale than uh, GIF files. Uh, but sometimes, oops, sorry. Sometimes your uh, your PNG doesn't store the like the best way out of the gate. So if you store something right out of Photoshop as a PNG file, it may not be using the most optimal arrangement of pixels to make things super compressed. So you can use tools like PNG Crush, which has there's a couple of like web interfaces for it. It's really it's a command line tool, and you can sometimes squeeze just a few more kilobytes out of there. I worked on a project uh, at Bitheads that uh, some of you have probably seen in movie theaters. It lets you uh, play video games before the movie starts, it's called Time Play. And one of the things is uh, in the theater, the game is randomly chosen. So you've got to send all the graphics to someone's phone in like a three or four second window. And it turns out if there's 200 people in the room, that's a challenge. So we had to squeeze every single inch of uh, space that we could out of the PNG files. And we used PNG Crush to, to really shrink them right down to the, the bare minimum. Uh, it would be really nice if uh, you could just have this automatically compressed for you so you don't have to think about it and like use command line tools and do all kinds of awful things. So you can integrate PNG compression stuff into your workflow or uh, on Drupal you can use the image optimize module. Uh, it's a really neat tool and the idea is whenever anyone uploads any images, like maybe you're just communications people who don't care about compression, um, the images will automatically get run through PNG crush or whatever other, whatever other tools you've got uh, linked up to it. There's some really neat ones that are available online. Uh, or, uh, oh, and kind of a neat bonus thing, you can use a drush command to go back through all of your archives and re-PNG crush everything that you've already uploaded. So it's not like wasted time. You can actually, like in like, a couple of seconds, go through your entire archive and save many, many megabytes of space. Um, but if you want to have a more sort of front-end view of it, there's a really neat tool called Squish App. Uh, this was invented by the Google people to show off some of their browser tricks. So uh, you can use it in Chrome. I think it works well in Firefox too. And the idea is you can upload an image and sort of see comparisons and contrasts. In this case, it's managed to take a 4.9 kilobyte uh, PNG file and bring it down to 3.6 kilobytes, which is like 25%, which is huge if you're really thinking about it. If you had a thousand of these, you'd be saving a lot of space. Uh, maybe not worth it for one image, but uh, when you think about multiplying it out by uh, all the images on your site, it ends up adding up. Uh, PNGs are sometimes used to create sprite sheets. This was really trendy a couple years ago, and uh, they're used everywhere now. Uh, the idea was to put a whole bunch of PNGs, because you can have as many colors as you like, you're not limited, a whole bunch of PNGs all together into one big file, and then ship that one file when the browser calls it. Uh, this was really trendy for a little while because we were trying to save all the calls that the browsers were making to back and forth from the server. So like, instead of loading 25 different images, you just load one image and use it everywhere. Uh, it's got a couple of like quirks to it though that we it makes it a little bit less popular now. One of them is that browsers are now way better at requesting multiple files at the same time. So your average browser Chrome requests ten at a time. So it's not like 
not like you're making 10 separate calls, you're really making like uh, a big scoop of, uh, of calls. So you're not saving that anymore. Also, uh, it ends up adding a whole bunch of uh, sort of technical debt on maintaining your site. So if someone needs to tweak one of those things or make a double size or something, now you've got to rewrite the whole sprite sheet and rewrite your CSS and do all kinds of stuff. If you are using sprite sheets, uh, and they are still cool, kind of cool and they can be appropriate in some cases, um, there's tools like Sprite Cow and there's a bunch of like image packing tools that will help you put a bunch of uh, sprites all together and it'll generate the CSS for you so you can uh, use the different parts of the image as icons in different places. One last note, sprite sheets are not great for accessibility. Uh, you can uh, put like spans with accessible um, area stuff all over it, but it ends up being a lot of work and uh, if your accessibility is really important to you, maybe it's better to stick with just a regular image. Uh, another quick kind of uh, a weird thing you can do with PNG files and, uh, and other um, uh, like GIF files even. Uh, if you're really into pixel art, and I've seen a lot of people who do game design and game development, uh, there's a cool uh, uh, organization in Ottawa called uh, Dirty Rectangles that has a bunch of people come in and talk about their game projects. Often on their websites they put little tiny pixel art but then they have to blow it up like 20 times and save it with like 10 times the resolution to make it look okay on a, on a regular computer screen. Uh, there's a whole bunch of like CSS that you can use to uh, Try to make that uh, just uh, store as like a nearest neighbor increase in your browser. Um, they're not super standardized, but there are CSS three and four proposed ones that are now uh, legal. So if you use image rendering crisp edges, you'll get a nice blown up image without having to actually save your image at 10 times the size that it should be. So it takes a little tiny image and blows it up and it doesn't blur it or stretch it or smear it. This is kind of an edge case. I don't know if anyone here makes games, but it was super amazing when I saw this. Um, the next kind of formats for talking about JPEGs and things, they use a thing called uh, perceptual compression or they take advantage of the fact that we're all made of meat. So uh, your eyes are really terrible at detecting certain kinds of color changes. So black and white images, those are the rods in your eyes. They see a lot of detail and you can pick out a lot of, uh, you can really clearly see an image that's in black and white. But if you look at just the color data in an image, your eyes are using cones and it's, everything's kind of smeary because your cones are actually much lower resolution uh, than your rods in your eyes. So JPEG takes advantage of this and takes your image, your color version of your image and shrinks it. It actually like throws away three quarters of your data uh, because you only use every fourth pixel in a JPEG because your eyes just can't see it. Uh, the black and white image stays full size. Then it breaks it up in little eight by eight chunks and converts each one of those little eight by eight chunks into a gradient or something um, that is oriented in the way that um, it can detect in the eight by eight chunk. I'm not explaining that super well. It uses this thing called wavelet compression, which is like tremendous amount of complicated math, but basically it's a little gradient. And if you look at this JPEG that's been like super hugeified, um, you can see a whole bunch of like uh, little gradients, if you look at every square individually, you can imagine how uh, JPEG might think, oh well, this one's just, it's all flat and pink, so it's just a flat wash, uh, but this one's got a couple more uh, sort of ripples in it, so it stores it as three or four gradients instead of one. Um, and this is, uh, your image compression uh, comes from how easily it can store those image gradients. Um, I'm gonna uh, get back to the gradients in a second, but, uh, Quick thing, when you're exporting from Photoshop, you may have always wondered, why does uh, Photoshop go up to 12 when everyone else goes up to 10 is just a, an arbitrary point where you're talking about uh, image quality. Uh, turns out Photoshop also only goes up to 10. Uh, a developer put 11 and 12 in uh, to test some things. They wanted to do a different kind of compression technique at 11 and at 12. And then they took it out, but they forgot to remove them off the banner. So 11 and 12 will let you save uh, files and they will be bigger, but it doesn't actually increase the quality of your image. Uh, basically, it's like adding zeros to the beginning of a number. It just uh, inflates your image. There's no benefit at all. And so there's a lot of like urban legends in the photography forums about how everyone saves their images at 12 because it's the best. But really, 10 is the best. 11 and 12 are just a total waste of time and space. So never go up past 10. Uh, there's also a weird thing that happens in the Save As tool. So uh, when you get down around, you'll see a little bit of a gradient. Zero starts at about halfway of what JPEG can do and compress. So uh, Photoshop didn't want people to be able to save images so terribly that everyone would blame it on Photoshop. So they said, okay, we're gonna start at like the 50% mark. Uh, then around uh, seven and six there, you'll see they're inverted at the top row. That's because six uses a different uh, quantization method to store the colors. Um, 
but it does it at a higher resolution than 7. So if you save an image at 6, it'll look nicer than if you save it at 7, and it'll be smaller. It's a really weird quirk. Uh, Photoshop are not really, uh, they haven't fixed it in like 30 years, so uh, it's not going to get fixed. So when you're saving images, remember 6 is better than 7. Um, <laughs> Lastly, the, uh, the Save for Web tool is another way to save a JPEG from Photoshop. Um, JPEG actually has a hard limit around 75%. Uh, I was talking about nine, uh, sorry, 11 and 12 being a waste. Anything over 75% in the Save as Web is also just a waste. You're adding zeros to the beginning of your numbers. It's, uh, it's nonsense. So uh, try to save your images in around 60%. If you uh, see that things are starting to get grainy, um, there's all kinds of like, uh, personal choice in like how much you compress your images, but know that anything over 75 is just, you're fooling yourself. Sorry, is that percentage of original size you're, you're So <clears throat> in, uh, in Photoshop, when you're using the Safer Web Tool, it lets you have a slider that goes, whoops, sorry, from zero to 100. And it's not a percentage, it's just some random arbitrary zero to 100. And uh, you can actually see they're kind of, they compress a little bit toward the end. It's a non-linear scale. Oh, go ahead. So Yeah, yeah. Now they've kind of gone back to the the one to ten scale. So Photoshop are they're adjusting things as they go. But uh, don't believe that the highest values will give you the best compression or the nicest images. Um, so a trick that a lot of people don't know exists is that uh, JPEG can compress different areas of your images at different compression rates. So you can take a really important area. So I've made the the face and the paw of the cat pink here and you can compress it less than the rest of the image and compress the rest of the image more. So here's an example of uh, the background is really looking garbled now. I've, I've made it really extreme so you can sort of see the difference, but the face of the cat is still nice and sharp. Uh, this is a real pain to do by hand because you've got to like go in and paint the area on every image that you want to keep really sharp and specify the area you want to be blurry. Uh, and you can get it wrong and it's, uh, it's tedious and it doesn't make any sense to do that in production. But wouldn't it be cool if there was a way a computer could do this for us? And in fact, there's a huge amount of research being done into this thing called structural similarity. Uh, the people who are advancing this research are the people who uh, run CDN networks. So people like Akamai and uh, Google and all kinds of places want to find a way to uh, save every penny on every image that they send. So they, they've uh, really invested in compression and doing the compression for you whether you know it or not. There's a whole bunch of other versions of this. If you're a super nerd, you can go and uh, Google a bunch of these things. They're, uh, they're really neat, some of them. They are perceptual references. What you're trying to do is teach the computer what's important about an image and what's not important. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that, so there's lots of different approaches by a lot of different people. Um, but the, uh, the really cool thing is some of them made their way into tools. Photoshop doesn't do it yet, but there's a neat tool online called Compressor Die. You upload an image, and what it looks for is the parts of the image where you wouldn't notice any data missing, and then it really compresses those areas, and the areas of the image where you would notice, it keeps them nice and crisp. So you can take an image that, in this case, was 600 ki something kilobytes, or 645 kilobytes, and it'll compress it down to 252 kilobytes, and there's literally no difference between these images. The way that they unpack uh, the 252 one is exactly pixel for pixel the same as the 645 one. So this is a really interesting and efficient way to store an image, but it's best left to a computer. So don't like do it by hand. Uh, you want to get an SSIM tool. Uh, are there any for Drupal? I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, what I'm first going to get to uh, is Retina and multi-res displays. Um, in, uh, in Retina uh, and on your Apple phone, uh, the density of the pixels is twice as high as the uh, density of like your screen on your computer, most likely, unless you've got a really fancy computer, in which case the density is also twice as high. Um, so people have been sort of obsessing with how do you provide a really crisp image for people who have nice mobile phones, but also a lightweight <coughs> image for people who have terrible mobile phones or bad screens. Uh, for a little while, uh, the idea was to have a whole bunch of different images and then use JavaScript to detect. Uh, we've kind of come a long way. There's uh, a really handy way uh, called uh, source set and sizes. It's uh, two uh, parameters you can add to your image uh, that say, on different screen resolutions with different uh, widths and, and sizes, use different uh, sources that have higher resolutions or lower resolutions depending. Uh, this saves a lot of space uh, in images being transmitted uh, to a phone and back, uh, and it's really handy for uh, determining uh, what's the best way to squeeze an image onto the, onto the page. There's a more advanced version of this that people are using now. 
uh, using the picture tag. So this is basically the same thing. The picture tag uh, holds a source uh, block, and the source block says, in the case where uh, the orientation is a, in a landscape mode, for instance, or some other CSS, uh, use a source set that is appropriate to a landscape image. But in the case where it's a portrait, use smaller images that are longer. You can actually art direct this way. This is uh, what this tag is used for. Uh, so if you wanted your thing to look totally different on mobile, you could actually use a really long image or a cropped image. It's kind of a trick. Uh, when we're using um, uh, images that our providers give to us, uh, sometimes they're like really wide banners and like they don't look good on a phone. Uh, sometimes they're really narrow. And uh, it would be nice to be able to say, use the wide one on a wide screen, use the narrow one on a narrow screen. So this picture uh, element lets you specify. Uh, notice that there's an image tag that's still in there. It's kind of like the default fallback. So image and source set are available on almost all the browsers, except there's one, uh, IE, of course, that everyone hates, uh, that has never implemented it in Opera Mini, which no one uses. So uh, you're safe to use the picture element on all these browsers, but it'll fall back correctly on IE if you have an image in that uh, picture tag. So anyway, I, I try not to make like walls and walls of text for you to like absorb, but take a look at picture tag when you get home. You'll uh, be really impressed with all the cool tricks you can do. Uh, picture tag in Google <laughs> is supported. There's a module. Uh, it's used by about 40,000 people. It's not a huge install base, but there are people sort of actively working on it. Uh, in Drupal 8, it's actually built in. It's a responsive image module. So when you're uploading stuff into Drupal 8, you can, it'll actually ask you, is there a wide version of this image? Is there a narrow version? Is there a high res version, a low res version? Um, and that's part of core, so you get it when you install the default version of Drupal. Uh, Drupal 7, the picture module, is actually a version of the response image module. It's been sort of downgraded to work with Drupal 7. Um, I think I have to leave this slide. I'm just going to go back to the idea of uh, using a computer to do SSIM stuff. There is a module in Drupal that uh, uses SSIM. Um, it's uh, under the picture... Anyway. You'll have to Google for it, but trust me, there's an SSIM tool for Drupal. Sorry, I deleted the slide, but there is one, and uh, it can be used to apply SSIM stuff directly to JPEGs and things that people uh, upload to your site. So your communications people don't need to think about it. They can just upload pictures, and they'll get optimized as, uh, as small as it can be crushed. Okay, lazy loading. Uh, another way you can use your images in an interesting way, uh, or at least save a lot of uh, space when you're transmitting your, your pages, is lazy loading. Say I have a Korean cat blog and it's got 300 pictures of cats on it. If someone loads my page, it's going to load 300 pictures and it's going to take you know, potentially megs and megs and megs of data to transfer. It would be nice if all the images that I can't see on my screen immediately would come only when I actually get down to scrolling down to see them. Uh, this is called lazy loading and it's in practice a lot. Uh, people use it all over the place and mostly people use JavaScript to do this. There's a bunch of libraries that are really popular. Um, and what happens is you put in a whole bunch of custom tags Instead of an image tag, it's an image with a source set. And uh, as the images get uh, hit by the browsers, you start to see them. Uh, the browser quickly goes ahead of you and like, loads the image, and it shows up as if it was always there. Uh, the really cool thing about that is maybe only 10% of your images get seen, so you're only transmitting 10% of them instead of transmitting 100% of them every time. Uh, this is a lot of work, actually, to implement. And especially if you're back uh, porting an old site, it's, uh, it can be really tedious to re-tag all of your images. Uh, so, good news. Uh, Chrome has gone ahead and said, you know what, why don't we just do this in the browser by default for everybody? So, uh, if you add the loading equals lazy tag to your images, uh, Chrome, who make up the lion's share of the browsing uh, population right now, at least according to our stats, will automatically start lazy loading your images. They will only load uh, when the browser actually sees them. Uh, it gets even better than this. This will be by default soon uh, for all images. So you'd have to set uh, loading equals, um, I think the term is uh, uh, eager uh, to make your images load otherwise. Like uh, Chrome has gotten smart enough to, the developers of Chrome have gotten smart enough to realize like we're, we're loading tons of images that no one ever sees. We should just handle this in the browser. So this is great news. Uh, all of us can just sit and our images, uh, um, our bandwidth rather, will go down as soon as the latest versions come out. Chrome only, but uh, Firefox have talked about it, so it'll probably come along. Once Chrome sort of sets the bar, I think uh, the rest of the browsers will follow suit. You'll, you'll, you'll really have like, no site and then Chrome enables it. No impact. Uh, actually, where it might impact it are things like image tracking, uh, because if you're using a pixel or something at the bottom of your site to do uh, 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 user tracking, like behavior tracking, 
you can, might have to force it to be uh, eager loading. Uh, Google, the reason they're taking so long to roll this out is because they want all the people who are using uh, pixels to do uh, user tracking to adapt their process a little bit to, to be ready for it, including Google, who use that for Google Analytics. So like they're, they're trying not to shoot themselves in the foot when they do this. Uh, quick note about alt tags while we're here. Uh, text around images is really important. Uh, we, uh, we kind of take for granted that uh, people come to our site can see, but uh, a lot of the time, uh, even if you have a, uh, just a half visual impairment or a moderate visual impairment, it can be really difficult to see what's going on in an image. Uh, remember to keep it short, uh, keep it contextual to the kind of uh, information that you expect a person would want to know about an image. We have these sort of endless debates in our office about like what should you actually put in there? And is it like a tell a three paragraph story about what's going on or do you just put the person's name or describe it's a cat or what? So uh, think about the context of the image. Uh, avoid spamming stuff in there. You don't need to say like, this is our cat and it's the best cat and it's like, you can just uh, uh, say it's a cat. Also, don't put photographer credits in alt tags. People are still doing this. I know everyone in this room knows better, but uh, for some reason people uh, keep sticking uh, credits and things in there which don't belong. Uh, alt tags can be a real pain <coughs> and tedious to write, especially if you've already got a thousand images on your site. Uh, it takes an actual writer time to write all the alt tags that go on the site. Uh, at the University of Ottawa, we sort of force our people, to our communications agents, to give us alt tags with all the images before we'll put them on the site, uh, at least usually. Um, but if you've already got a thousand images on your site, how do you get them in? Uh, there's a whole bunch of really cool AI tools that are doing image recognition, and there are image APIs. Uh, this is the Microsoft <coughs> Azure one, where you uh, send it in an image, and it'll give you a JSON file with what's in that image, or at least what it thinks is in that image. 99% of the time, it's bang on. 1% of the time, it's totally off. Uh, it'll, this is a cabbage or something. It's, uh, it's a little bit interesting and sort of spooky at how well it works usually. Um, so what you actually get in the object file that comes back from this image is that it's pretty sure it's a mammal. It gives you like a, a confidence rating. It's pretty sure it's a cat. Uh, pretty sure it's brown. It's got a lot of uh, uh, sort of obvious things. But then it'll actually form a sentence for you and say, this is a cat with a ball of string. Uh, and that could be your alt tag. This is a really handy way to uh, enable alt tags, a whole bunch of like old stuff that you uh, don't want to have to rewrite manually. Uh, and there are modules to do this in Drupal. Um, however, there's only like seven people using the one for Azure right now. Uh, it does work, I gave it a try. I loaded it and, uh, and you can actually uh, use Drush to do a backport of all of your old images and it'll alt tag them all for you uh, magically. And 99% uh, of them will be great, 1% of them will be a cabbage or something. Um, so you want to go through and take a look after you've done this. You don't do that? We don't do it at the university, uh, officially, but uh, it would be really cool to have it sort of pre-populate the alt tags. And I know in some of the new versions of Drupal, like I think in Drupal 9, they're proposing that by default, whenever you upload an image, it's going to go ahead and try to give you a guess at what that alt tag is. Uh, Instagram uses this right now, so if you've ever like moused over an image on Instagram, even if you don't give it an alt tag, it tries to guess, this is a person sitting on a chair. Um, and it's really good, it's, uh, it's uh, spooky good, but uh, it's not 100% ready for production. It also takes a little effort to integrate it into your workflow. I assume it's only in English? No, it, you can actually specify languages, and uh, the Microsoft Azure one does, I think, 26 languages. Uh, Google also has a, an API to do basically the same thing, and I think they do a thousand languages or something, they've got all these uh, interesting ones. So it'll do Klingon and stuff if you want. <laughs> so you, that's a... There's a lot of like gray area. I'm totally on board with your idea. Uh, our process at the university is if it's a completely decorative item, uh, don't alt tag it. Uh, we have a lot of debates about if an image uh, is immediately described below the image, is there any value in describing the image? We don't, we, we just assume that people are gonna just read the text that comes along with the image. Um, there's a lot of like best practice stuff that's still a little bit wishy-washy. Uh, what you want to think about is your users first, right? So if a person's coming to your site, what would they expect or want? And so we do a lot of user testing, try to uh, understand that. It's, uh, it's a bit of a gray area. I don't think there's any hard and fast rules about how you do your alt tagging, but uh, it's important for people who are coming to your site. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, it, it makes sense. I mean, as far as, far as my workflow, I just refer to Black Guys and that's it. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's what we should all be doing. Yep. Yeah, Whatever 
AODA has lots of uh, suggestions, and yeah, some of them are a little bit not 100% specific. They say you should do this. What, what really counts as a decorative item? What doesn't? But they uh, support that then too. They do. They do. Yeah, uh, almost all the kegs in AODA. So yeah, uh, use your best judgment. Uh, AI is a really handy tool for helping you with the work. It's not as good as a human writer, uh, but it's a lot cheaper than a human writer, and uh, in a lot of cases, it'll get your images right. Uh, also, just in terms of like SEO support, naming your images is actually important. It's something that we never bothered to do for a really long time. So we have a lot of images on our site that are like IMG0098 or something, and uh, that tells Google nothing, it tells your users nothing. No one should really be looking at your images, but uh, if image search is gonna try to quickly guess what your image is about, it helps to have a little bit of a, a common sense name. So in this case, two tabby cats.jpg. Also kind of a nice uh, feature, uh, add your site to the beginning of it so people know where it came from. So after they've saved all your pictures to a hard drive to use in their PowerPoint presentations, they'll remember like, oh, I got it from Yuatua, I stole it. Uh, you can go too far. It's not really a place for an alt tag. You don't need it to say, so one black and one gray cat looking to the side and they're going on a walk and they're like in the forest. You don't need all that in the file name. You can keep the file name short, but uh, try to make the file name sensical. And uh, it'll also help you when you're looking back through your uh, your Drupal list of files, you're going to say, what is image 0098? I don't remember, you'll have to click it. But if you see two tabby cats, you'll say, oh, that is that picture of the two cats. Uh, totally different kind of graphic you could put on your site, SVGs. Uh, people have been using SVGs for a little while, but uh, you still haven't uh, picked up really high adoption rates. Uh, usually they're very small, they're vector images, so they're really great for logos. They keep your logo nice and crisp in the browser, and no matter what scale you use. And the idea is you're really storing the data points of the outline of the image and not just like a bunch of pixels. So it can scale up, it can scale down, you can print it, it comes out really nice. Uh, another neat quirk about SVG is it's basically stored as HTML. It's an XML file format. So you can actually cut and paste this directly into your HTML document and you don't have to embed an image, it's just there. It's like part of the, uh, part of the document structure. This can make it a real pain for editing later on but uh, you can actually uh, save a lot of space and not use a full image. Usually they're really small. This one's down to 300 bytes. It's an outline of a cat and it's, uh, it's uh, pretty useful and it'll work at any scale. Uh, icon fonts were also really big for a little while and uh, they seem to have kind of plateaued and there's a reason for that. Uh, Font Awesome, Bootstrap 3 Glyph icons are really cool. The Noun Project is a neat website that has lots of icons on it. Uh, the problem with uh, icon fonts is they're really terrible for accessibility. You can uh, assign them to a tag and then do a bunch of like uh, extra span classes around this thing, but you're really defeating the purpose of having a simple icon uh, if it ends up being more work to do this. So what I usually do is use these uh, in Photoshop to produce icons as uh, PNG files or uh, as SVGs. Uh, another way to get images onto your site, HTML canvas tag lets you actually draw things directly into your site using all kinds of cool JavaScript libraries. There's ones for graphs, there's ones for charts, there's ones for doing art and uh, uh, kinetic animations and uh, there's scene graph. There's, uh, I've listed like eight here, seven, uh, but there's like 3,000 separate uh, versions of cool libraries that people have done to work with Canvas. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their own kind of flavor of how they like to work with Canvas. Um, some accessibility is built into Canvas, so you can actually alt tag it and uh, if your JavaScript is really clever, if you're displaying like a bar graph or something, you can actually uh, procedurally write out all the values from the bar graph into the alt tag. So um, these are kind of a neat way to uh, take a lot of data and generate images instead of uh, sort of hard coding an image or baking an image and having to update it every three months. Uh, I want to take a little look into the future of images. Uh, we've talked a lot about the past and the present, but uh, there's some really neat things coming how are we doing for time? Oh, I'm like right on the ball. Okay, perfect. So uh, a couple of things you uh, may already be aware of or not. Uh, WebP is Google's new tool. This is a, a super compressed cat. Uh, this is, it actually, it comes from uh, Google Street View. They stitched it wrong and it's just eerie and cool. So anyway, WebP is uh, Google's latest format. It's basically the same as JPEG. It works all the same way. Uh, it breaks your image down into little chunks. It stores them as gradients. It uses wavelets. Um, but there's a little bit of extra math magic going on here. I'm not gonna even try to explain this to you because I can't understand it, but uh, what it does is predicts ahead of time what the next blocks are gonna be in the image, and if they're not different, then you've won, and you can compress that area extra well. So, 
For instance, a big chunk of blue sky, if you had a photo of the Toronto skyline, uh, it will see three or four blue blocks in a row and say, I bet the next like 10 are going to be blue. And if they are, then you've compressed all those 10. And uh, eventually you'll hit the CN Tower and it says, whoa, 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 the, this block has changed. So you're not only compressing each area of the, of the image, but you're compressing blocks of area of the image. So it compresses usually 30% better than a JPEG. Uh, and it looks about the same. And uh, if you've got a really cool command line SSIM tool, uh, you wouldn't even notice the difference and you'll save 30% off the bat. So WebP is supported by all the major browsers, uh, except IE, of course. Ah! Uh, also, uh, Safari. Um, Apple are being a little bit hardball about WebP. They still haven't implemented it, even like today. Uh, and it's been out since 2010, so I don't expect that it's ever gonna come around to Safari. When you uh, post an image with a WebP, uh, when you post an image on your site using WebP, uh, if you use that picture element, you can have a fallback that loads a JPEG instead. That's extra work for your communications people to do or for you to upload. But if you've got all those like cool image optimization tools already set up in Drupal, maybe it automatically stores two versions of every image. One is a WebP, one is a JPEG. Uh, hike is an interesting one. Hake, hike, we're gonna have a GIF and GIF problem with this one again. Uh, it's Apple's proprietary format. Hike have, uh, was invented to save images on your camera because people are taking thousands and thousands of pictures on their cell phones and cell phones are not getting bigger at the scale that uh, is going to accommodate all these amazing camera resolutions that they've got. So basically it's the same as JPEG, kind of similar to WebP, uh, except it saves up to 50% more uh, than the space that you would save as a JPEG. Uh, it's cool technology, but it's a little bit proprietary and only Apple own it. Uh, but they want to integrate it into the web. There's still all these rumors that it's coming. However, even though it's available on the desktop, 50% smaller, um, it's not available in any browser yet, including the Safari browser, which is kind of weird because Apple invented it and they own the Safari browser. So uh, it is coming. They, there's all these rumors that Hike is coming. You can export it from Photoshop right now, and uh, you'll notice that it takes a little longer to save than a JPEG. Uh, that's because they do all the extra effort in the compression, uh, but it's quite fast to load and it's quite fast to unpack. Uh, some other interesting new formats that are kind of on the horizon, Google's working on this one called VP10. It's uh, actually, most of these are video compression formats that they also use for images because video is their next big area of conquest because YouTube uh, is storing like a billion new videos a day. They need some way to get these down really small. Google's VP10 uh, is a, a cool tool, sort of similar to WebP, it's the next generation. Mozilla has one called Dala. If anyone is like a super hardcore Star Wars nerd, it's named after a general in a book or something. It's like really like, uh, obscure, but it's uh, Mozilla's tool that uh, does some really neat things. One of them is that it'll do time compression. So if you store your image and it's got uh, the same uh, sort of background over a whole bunch of frames, uh, it does predictions into depth of your uh, image. So uh, it stores tons of data really small. Uh, Cisco has one called Thor, and just for the sake of getting one more cat into my presentation, this is Thor cat. It's here. Um, Another one that's uh, really cool and on the horizon is AVIF. Uh, AVIF can store an image uh, between 50 and 70% better. So this is a test I ran that used a, a JPEG, a WebP that stored at about 26% better, uh, and AV1 is an AVIF file. It stored at 50% better uh, with the same uh, SIM uh, quality, so the image looks the same to a user. Um, AVIF was uh, invented by Netflix, and the idea is to store uh, images that are uh, in video formats really, really well, but it does one frame videos uh, also really, really well. So uh, Netflix have uh, devices all over the place. So you already have AVIF decompression tools on your like TV boxes and in your laptops and uh, in the software that you've got on your machines. Uh, so it's kind of ready to be launched into the browser and it's coming really soon. They, uh, they promised that AVIF was gonna be in the browser in the next year. Uh, so we may have a whole bunch of AVIF tools the adoption of these tools really dependent on uh, the content producing tools uh, accepting it. So as soon as AVIF shows up in Photoshop and all these other tools, we'll start seeing it probably in the browser as well. And uh, it'll be uh, an even smaller box for that cat to crawl into. Uh, in summary, six is better than seven. Don't use seven in Photoshop. Uh, automate all your compression if you can because it's a lot, uh, it's really tedious to do it by hand. It causes a lot of human effort, but you can, uh, automate everything in Drupal with the background uh, tools, and uh, try to keep things small because your users are not uh, getting things as quickly as you think they are, um, and uh, they pay a lot of money for their bandwidth. Thank you very much for attending my talk.
I'm not sure we have time for questions. I think they were kind of right on the on the mark. But if anyone's got any more, I'll try to squeeze one or two in and come chat with me up here. I'll be around. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, if you're using <coughs> you show us lots of stuff for compressed images, but if you're using Drupal, say image action stuff like that, mm -hmm. does that just blow everything away, or does it make a difference? If you have like Drupal's image action, you can do a lot of configuring. So Drupal 7's image magic is really rudimentary. It only does gives and JPEGs. Yeah, what is and Drupal 8, uh, use a new version of Image Magic that's way better, and it supports WebP, but not out of the box. So you've got to do a bunch of custom configuring to add those extra image formats. Um, and there's, it's going to be effort. It's going to be a development effort. Drupal 9 has a whole new, well, they're projecting a whole new version of Image Magic is going to be used, or maybe even getting away from Image, image Magic, and then you can use other libraries to do image compression. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you may be able to do some really cool things. It'll be up to you and your developers and what modules get uh, created. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm asking is, Right, right. So if I take, you know, my picture of you, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I compress it with Photoshop or an online tool, or whatever, mm -hmm. then I upload that using, you know, Drupal, WordPress, whatever. It does its own image processing. Is there any point in me looking at that in the first place, or is it just getting all blown away by? Right. I totally get your question now. Okay, yeah. Uh, so it depends on how you've got your site configured. Uh, WordPress goes ahead and does a lot of things for you. In fact, WordPress are way ahead of the game on a lot of this recompression stuff. They've had picture tag in it for a long time. Um, it's going to be a, totally up to, again, how you configure things. Uh, some of the uh, uploading uh, automation stuff in WordPress is configurable. Some of it's not, some of it's baked in. And then you wonder, like, in the new version of WordPress, is it going to do a different kind of compression? Is it going to go back and recompress everything in my image folder? Like. Uh, you have to do your research and figure out about the tool and what it'll do. Uh, Drupal doesn't assume any of this for you, so you'll have to manually uh, add new tools to, to change the way it does compression. But I get what you're saying, like if you do a really good compression job and then you upload it to WordPress and then it recompresses it at like 70%, then you've lost all that effort that you've put in. Uh, some of the time, uh, the tool will be smart enough to recognize the compression level in the image already, and if it's below its threshold, it won't bother going ahead and recompressing that. So you're not wasting your time. Uh, and it should be that way for most tools. I know WordPress is smart enough to know that you've compressed something lower than its uh, standard. Um, but CDNs and stuff, they all have their own way of doing things. Um, Drupal's image magic tool, you may have to set a slider somewhere. I haven't dug around in there for that particular use case. But uh, that's an interesting question. I'll have to think about it more. Hi. Yeah, I know. I was just going to say there's also um, third party um, image optimization that I think Yeah, I, I've been like saying Photoshop all through this presentation, but there's like all kinds of interesting cool tools. Pixlr Online is a really good one yeah, that I like. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, compressions like, like Squish App that I suggested for doing the compression. Um, so, I mean, if you don't use Photoshop, then there's other tools that also export to JPEG. And some of them have already integrated some of this really cool uh, like SSM stuff uh, into their uh, workflows. Uh, maybe it's automatic for you, that would be really cool. Uh, some of them have not yet, and they are a little bit late to catch up. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and have a great Drupal conference. I'm uh, very excited and uh, looking forward to seeing all the rest of the presentations. Take care.